Welcome, everybody, to Sports on Tap. Week one of the high school football season has come and gone. Ed Dick here with not Rob Troutman uh, and Duck Dog, if you're looking at the Zoom, uh, the Zoom names. Uh, Rob Troutman is out on assignment tonight. Josh Jeffy, Sean Duffy, Ed Dick here, bringing you week one coverage of action from the Greater Cleveland Conference, the Southwestern Conference, the Suburban League, and the Great Lakes Conference. Uh, gentlemen, we have finally we finally arrived. Uh, we, we got some games in, although um, Sean and myself uh, experienced a lot of wetness along with everybody else in the Northeast Ohio area. Uh, but how are we doing today? Night? How are we doing tonight, boys? Good, doing good. Yeah, Holy doing real good. Off. Yeah, that's uh, it's kind of amazing that we're we're talking about week one recap already. So it's. Again, we've gone from zero to 60 in my mind of not really thinking about football to all of a sudden we're already recapping. So, but it is, uh, it's definitely good to be back. It is yeah, a beautiful thing. <laughs> we, are, we are full tilt boogie into the 2020 season. And with, us, and with us being back uh, here on the weekly basis and out covering games, make sure you follow Sports on Tap at SOT Podcast is our Twitter handle. Uh, we will. We do give live recaps of games that we are covering. Uh, check out our, our website, sportsontappodcast.com. You'll see uh, the recap of the Sports on Tap game of the week, a scoreboard of what's going on in the four conferences that we cover, and you also see matchups uh, for the pre for the following week as well. Uh, we also uh, also vote for the G and G Fitness. Coach of the week, which will happen on Saturday afternoons. So the poll usually goes up Saturday morning, and we run it for the for the course of the day. And we will also be giving away our giving out our uh, players of the uh, of the conference for our respective conferences tonight as well. Uh, and make sure you jump on our website and vote on that. Uh, similarly, all right, we um we'll we'll certainly get to uh, Berea Mid Park versus Ashland, which was our SOT uh, podcast game of the week that Sean went to Finney Stadium for. But first, as we normally do, we will kick it off with action from the Greater Cleveland Conference. Josh Jeffrey, take it away. Yeah, just to recap everyone on, on how the Greater Cle uh, Cleveland Conference is, is up and running this year. Uh, Shaker Heights uh, did leave the conference, so they are no longer in the conference. Uh, and uh, Solon, uh, as of as of right now, not playing any games. They do have a couple of games, however, scheduled. Uh, they will be coming back and playing. Uh, according to JoeIdle.com, uh, on September 17th, they will be playing St. Vincent, St. Mary. Uh, and on October 2nd, they will be playing a conference matchup uh, against Medina. Uh, so those, as of right now, the only two confirmed games uh, that I see for Solon. Uh, but other than that, the other um, five remaining teams – um, are playing uh, with the exception of strong zone week one. They did have a positive COVID-19 test uh, earlier uh, a couple a couple weeks ago. So their game against Benedictine got canceled, uh, but they will be back in the fold uh, this week. Uh, so to the teams that were actually playing on the field, we're going to open up. Uh, Euclid traveled to Brunswick in this game. Uh, Brunswick had a great opening drive. Uh, they went 13 plays, but I'm sorry, Ed, they did miss the field goal on the opening drive. Um, but they were still able later on uh, in that quarter to get on the board first. Conan Sam with a four-yard touchdown run for the Blue Devils, and that made it seven to nothing. The extra point was good, by the way, so not all was lost. Uh, for Euclid, they did come back uh, later on. Uh, Malachi Davis scored on a 51-yard uh, touchdown uh, Mal Malachi Davis had a 51-yard touchdown pass to Armand Scott. Uh, that actually tied the game at half. Now, remember, as, as Ed and Sean mentioned, it was raining all night during these games, so it was very tough field conditions. Not only that, having a lack of practice time, lack of uh, preparation uh, for the season. So you're going to get some sloppy football, whether the conditions were wet or dry. But in this game, like all of them, it was really wet. Um, Later on for Euclid in the second half, Cam Smith had an interception. He ran the, bar down, uh, ran the ball down uh, to the four-yard line. Atiba uh, Fitz scored for Euclid, and that's all they needed uh, for this one. And they ended up winning 14-7. Now, Brunswick did have a touchdown uh, that was called back. 
Um, they ended up missing a field goal on this one. And, and here in a minute, we can get Ed to talk about it. Ed, obviously, the uh, one of the special team assistant coaches uh, for Brunswick. So, Ed, you know, how did this game kind of work out for you? You did have a couple of missed field goals here that, that you know, on, on games that are this sloppy and this tight, those missed field goals turns up to be big. Certainly. Uh, so we, we have a, we have some new, we have some new uh, rather inexperienced kickers coming up this year. Um, you know, one of the studs from the soccer team, his name's Gavin Ernst. He's a, uh, he's a goalkeeper, a uh, very, very good player. Um, uh, he, he had the first crack at it uh, from the, from the 17 yard line and pushed it right. Um, that's a tough field goal, no matter where, no matter how you put it, it was a, uh, you know, there's no such thing as a chip shot. I will always say that because that's how I, I, I grew up that way. Um, I know, I know other folks may, may disagree with that when they see it on TV. Um, and then later in the game, after that, after the touchdown was called back due to a holding call, our, uh, our junior kicker, uh, Noah Bartzak, um, and this is his third year uh, being with the GV and varsity program. He got his first opportunity and he was a little, he was a little wide left from a 31 yards out. Um, and, you know, it's hard to ignore what is hard to ignore that, you know, what, what could have potentially have happened there. Um, we did, we were driving late in the game and we got to about the 20, 22 yard line. Um, and instead of being down seven, we or one, we were down by seven and, you know, if, if we, who's to say, if we, if we were in up, if we had an opportunity, the wind was at our back in the fourth quarter, given, even given the conditions, um, you know, we may have given a shot. We may not have, I, I, I'll leave that off to coach Benzoni, but um, uh, it was, it was tough sledding. Uh, Euclid, Euclid is a great team and they're going to win a lot of games this year, but this is one game where uh, for all intents and purposes, we outgain them. Uh, they really only hit us on a couple of a couple of plays on the 51 yard touchdown pass. Our defender fell, and so the the the, the, the receiver had time to settle under it, and, and he caught it and, and ran it in. And then, as as you mentioned, the interception return that was almost housed for a pick six. They started with a short field, um, and they were able to they were able to punch it in. So. Um, Certainly, uh, certainly some a lot, a lot of a lot of opportunities to uh, you know to learn. Um, you know now now both guys that that, that attempted field goals they now have varsity f- football experience, and uh, I, I have no doubt that we'll make the the necessary adjustments going forward. Yeah, and like you said, it, it's even tough to make your you know uh, gain that experience in conditions like there was. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you know missed opportunities. I uh, had for Brunswick definitely learning experiences uh, for this group, uh, this Brunswick group that uh, will hopefully, you know, learn from it and, and add, add that experience and add more wins uh, here in the future. Certainly. Well, one more, since I've just mentioned, the defense did a tremendous job. Uh, yeah. I mean, even with the conditions, uh, limiting Euclid as much as they did is a real credit uh, to, to how, how great the defense played. Um, and when you give up 14 points against Euclid, more often than not, you're probably going to win that game. So uh, kudos to the uh, kudos to the defense um, and the offensive line also for pushing out uh, and giving the running backs some room to run. All right, thanks for that, Ed. Uh, moving on to the other uh, next game in the GCC, uh, and this was a really good matchup between uh, two really good teams, uh, Menor and Medina. Uh, Medina started off the game. Ryan Farrell recovered a fumble. And the Bees drove 70 yards in 10 plays. Drew Aller, quarterback for the Bees, hit Luke Hensley uh, in the end zone for a touchdown. The extra point was actually blocked on this one. That was uh, Hensley's first of two touchdowns on the night. He ended the night with 10 receptions and 104 yards and two scores. Uh, Menor's first score uh, came from Ian Kipp, uh, their stud quarterback, three-yard TD run. The extra point was good, made it 7-6. to six. They then scored again on a fumbled punt. Uh, from by the bees, and then uh, Kip hit Ian Har- e- Evan Harper, excuse me, from five yards to make it 14 to six. Teams traded scores again. Andrew Smith, 46 yard field goal to make it 23 to 19. Menor at the half. This was a highly, uh, highly competitive game uh, in that first half. Both teams looked really sharp, uh, coming out ready to play. Uh, start the second half. Medina, uh, Medina's Drew Aller. Um, Hurt actually during warm-ups, and he would not return. 
Uh, and unfortunately for Medina, they would not score the rest of the game. Uh, Menner then from there, uh, after their field goal at the end of the half, reeled off another 20 straight unanswered points uh, in this one. Um, and Menner ended up scoring winning the game a 37 to 19 some stats to end the game uh, Medina's Drew Aller in one half was 17 for 26 for 127 yards uh three TDs he also had 49 rushing yards again he did not play in the second half due to an ankle injury uh for Minner Ryan Coglin 19 carries 115 yards and, and two scores and then Ian Kipp had 165 yards passing with two scores uh, Menner continues their winning ways. Uh, Matt Gray was my nominee for the GCC Coach of the Week on our G&G Fitness Coach Bowl. Like Ed said, those go, go up on Saturdays, and those actually run through Sundays. Uh, tonight we're going to do – that's fine. We're, tonight we're going to do the players. Uh, we're going to nominate our players for the conference. That poll will run from tonight uh, until tomorrow night, so make sure you get on there. Uh, back to the schedule at hand, the final game – uh, in the GCC, it was Elyria 27, uh, Elyria Catholic 7, so an inner city battle for these two. Uh, for Elyria, Jaheim Atkinson uh, was the workhorse for uh, the Pioneers, 27 carries, 164 yards, and at least a touchdown. Elyria Catholic uh, quarterback, uh, Stephen no Nowinski, hope I get his name right, 10 of 29 passing. I got um, you, dude. Uh, Steven Navalinsky. Thank you very much, Ed. That's what we're a good team effort here. Um, now, you got to give some credit to the Elyria defense. They came out. They actually held Elyria Catholic to negative rushing yards in this game, uh, which is a, a big thing to do, especially uh, in weather conditions where you're going to have a lot of running. So um, it's good, good on Elyria. Uh, same thing. Weather conditions may have played a part in this one, but when you have Gene Atkinson running as well as he did, Elyria only uh, uh, attempted 13 passes in this one, uh, but they didn't need it. 27 to 7, uh, the final score, Elyria with the victory. Uh, next week, uh, week two, I should say this week, it is a all-GCC matchup. Menor will travel to Euclid. Uh, Strongsville, back in the fold, will travel to Elyria. And I will be at Brunswick for Medina, Brunswick. Looking forward to that one. Uh, I will be covering the game, Sports on Tech. That will be our uh, game of the week there. Um, and my player nominee is the aforementioned Jaheim Atkinson of Elyria. 27 carries, 164 yards, and a touchdown, leading his team to a 27-7 uh, victory. And that wraps up a short uh, GCC recap. Um, some some good uh, good things, especially for the Men of Medina uh, game. I'm looking at Medina as kind of a, a, a team to watch in the GCC this year. I think they have a lot of offensive power that can really compete uh, and score a lot of points in this conference. So I'm looking at them. Uh, they put up a good effort against Menor. There's a lot, there's a lot to like if you're in Medina. Uh, you know, Drew Allar's uh, injury aside, they do have a, I believe they still have a quarterback on the roster who played quarterback last year, um, who is able to fill in, obviously coming up against a, a state top contender like Mentor. Um, you probably going to have a little bit of struggle there, but if Aller can get healthy uh, specifically in time for the playoffs in week seven, that, that's a, that's certainly a team to be afraid of. Um, it, it, they, they run a five, four or five wide set and Aller is pinpoint accurate and he's only a junior, you know, so, right. you know, he's going to be, um, he's going to be one to watch, uh, especially going into his senior year next year, for sure. You know, one of the things that I looked at, <clears throat> when looking at the GCC, just one, uh, is, you know, I, I know there's a lot of disappointment in the way Brunswick play, but taking into account the weather, um, taking into account, again, like Josh mentioned, the, 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 short, the shortened preseason, so to speak, the not normal offseason, everything like that, I wouldn't <clears> – <throat> I, I certainly wouldn't hit the panic button on, on Brunswick. I think Brunswick is going to have a – pretty good season thing to keep in mind is last week we talked to coach john hunick from berea mid park who's also a hockey coach we deal with this a lot when we cover our our our, our hockey teams is you know th this more so than any year is an opportunity for a team to get better week to week and i look at a team like brunswick and and like you said medina who 
may have struggled, but look at the opponent they played. Ed hit it right on the head. It, you got in, you know, not not taking into account the rain, a team like Euclid plays fast, and they then they couldn't get out and play fast. I mean, it's it's tough to play fast in the rain, but teams that can do it are or that are fast normally are just slightly less fast when it's raining out. But we saw something in the defensive effort, and I think what happens is the the defense usually to begin the season is way out ahead of an offense. They, it's it's easier to react. It's easier to capitalize on mistakes that the other offense is going to make. I look for Brunswick to take a big step forward this week um, going against a team like Medina. I think you're really going to have – a battle of two teams that need to get on track quickly. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of more offensive consistency um, because I don't think they're going to have to contend with the weather. Uh, But it may seriously, Ed, come down to whose special teams are better. I think if you look at these two teams, they're very, they're way too similar. And you may be seeing it, you know, a situation where it comes down to, you know, a 35 yard field goal to win it. And, you know, that's where – and that's – and I think that's where that game can be really exciting. Um, but it was – that was impressive to me because as bad as the, we got the report from Brunswick um, and they didn't play well offensively, I looked at that score and I'm like, yeah, but Euclid usually doesn't just put up 14. Usually they're in shootouts. Rarely do they ever get stopped. You know what I'm saying? It's one thing if, like, it was a 28-21 game – and that, but 14-7, I mean, that's that's a low-scoring game for, an, for a Euclid Panther team that's very, very good and very fast and likes to put up points in bunches. Certainly. And, and you know, offensively, we were able to move the ball on the ground. You know, so it wasn't a complete loss. It wasn't a lost effort on the offense either. It was just we, we had some ill-timed penalties, and we obviously had, we obviously had some other mistakes that got us. And, um, you know, to your point, Sean, We'll be ready to go, come a Dinah. No, no, no questions. All right. So that does it with uh, you know, Josh. Thanks for the Greater Cleveland Conference. Uh, we generally will u- utilize uh, Rob Troutman here as he usually does the Southwestern Conference. I will, uh, I will help him out on this. He did do the recaps um, and send them over to us. Um, so while he's on assignments, we will certainly pick up, uh, pick up for him, as that's what we do here. So we will start first. Midview versus Olmstead Falls. The Bulldogs of Olmstead Falls jumped out early with a seven-yard touchdown run by Ryan Fiskanich on their second possession. Uh, they led six nothing after a missed extra point. They would then jump up, to, jump out to a twenty-seven to nothing lead uh, before the middies of Midview were able to get on the board. A thirteen-yard touchdown pass from Ethan Surdock to wide receiver Joey Brakovich. Olmstead Falls had a big game from Andrew Parkowski and Ryan Fekskanich, each with two touchdowns. Olmstead Falls with 286 total yards. Uh, they pretty much tripled up Midview's 76 yards. The Bulldogs with a big win, 35-7 to over Midview. Moving to North Ridgeville versus Amherst. Amherst, the Comets, started the first quarter with a 10-yard touchdown run by Mackie Purdue. Amherst quarterback Tyler Brezina. Uh, threw a 21 touchdown, 21 yard touchdown strike to Ty Weatherspoon to give the Comets a 14 to nothing first quarter lead. They did not look back. Purdue scored again. Tyler Brezina and uh, Weatherspoon all scored. The Comets with a big 35 to nothing victory over the Rangers of North Ridgeville. Um, Tory uh, uh, Tory Weatherspoon 15 rushes for 101 yards. Jonathan West. 18 rushes for 100 yards as well. So the two running backs go over 100 yards each for Amherst. A big win for the Comets over the Rangers. Uh, Avon versus Avon Lake. This game took place on Saturday. This was, it was not able to happen on Friday night. Avon Lake dominated the first half with a 24-7 halftime lead. Shoreman running back Mason Wheeler, he, got, he racked up 104 rushing yards and a pair of touchdowns just in the first half. The Eagles of Avon, their defense got some big stops, and the Eagles were able to claw their way back to, into the game. The Eagles offense and Avon quarterback Nico Pappas scored on a three-yard touchdown run to tie the game at 24 with just 139 left in the fourth quarter. This game went into overtime, not one, but two overtimes. Avon ended the game when Pap- quarterback Pappas hit wide receiver Cam 
Erskine over the middle on a 20 yard uh, for a 21 yard uh, excuse me 20 yard touchdown the game winner Avon completes the comeback a 33 to 30 win in double overtime such a great game between those two rivals uh, quarterback Nico Pappas led the Eagles back with a with 227 pa- uh, yards passing he had three touchdowns he also rushed for 90 yards and a score um in this effort for the Eagles. So big, big win there uh, for Avon over Avon Lake. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, Berea Mid Park was involved in the uh, game of the week. Sean uh, did our story on the website, and he will talk about that game here in a little bit. As far as the Southwestern Conference Player of the Week, Rob went with Avon quarterback Nico Pappas. He had three touchdowns off of 227 yards passing. Then he also rushed for hundred for another 90 yards and a score Four total touchdowns for Nico Pappas over 300 total yards. So tremendous effort in that victory there for week two. Avon is one and oh, they will visit one and oh, Olmstead falls. Avon Lake is oh, and one, they will take on Berea mid park. Midview, 0-1. They will host the 1-0 Amherst Comets. North Ridgeville is 0-1. They will host North Olmstead, who uh, was not able to partake in the first game uh, due to their uh, due to some COVID-related uh, COVID-related options there uh, issues there. Uh, so hoping to get back on the field for week two. So uh, the Southwestern Conference just continues to pick up where it leaves off with the, with the competition. Um, I think some of the teams that we've seen or that, that we were expecting to see some good things from certainly stated their case, Olmstead Falls, Amherst, and then uh, with Avon and Avon Lake both pummeling each other and, and coming out with a great, with a great game and Avon getting the win there. Um, you know, what are your guys' thoughts on the Southwestern Conference? Well, it's really good to see Olmstead Falls uh, actually have a passing touchdown. Uh, those uh, <laughs> over the uh, over, double check the last, over the last uh, few years, those have been few and far between because they are one heck of a running team. They they have a, a great offense that relies heavily on that run. But uh, in this game against Midview, they were able to spread the ball around uh, and have a lot of key contributors on offense. So they got off to a, a good start. Uh, you know, it just – you have the, the neighborhood robbery again, a- Avon, Avon Lake. It's always a fantastic game. And this one, you know, got kind of – got delayed, got postponed to Saturday. But uh, good things must uh, wait. And this was obviously a good game. Avon was a great comeback victory uh, for them. They, they are off to, like you said, Ed, just continuing what they're doing, off to a great right. start. Um, yes. And, you know, we'll, we'll mention the uh, Berea Mid Park Ashland game here uh, in a little bit. And of course, you have North Ridgeville um, with a uh, you know with a tough loss against Amherst, uh, thirty-five nothing. But um, still, it, it good to get back out on the field. And this conference, like you said, is picking up right where they left off. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, like you said, Josh, that's that's a great way to put it. It's a neighborhood rivalry. It's it's one of the great traditions we've had in the last couple of years is that this scheduling wise. Avon Avon Lake is right up there in the front, and they're up there doing, <laughs> doing uh, you know, they're up there, and it's always a great game. I mean, rarely is it a blowout. It always comes down to the last. I, you know, what's funny is we were sitting around, and we were doing our, uh, our, 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 our fantasy football draft, in which I think I have made some great strides. But I made the comment when we were checking scores that, you know. Avon Lake was up big on them. I think it was 21-7. Um, and it was just about halftime. They ended up putting a, a field goal on the board. And I was like, wow, that's surprising. And, you know, little do we know, we checked back a little bit later. And it's like, oh, it's now it's a double overtime. Or now it's going to overtime. They tied it up. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting. But it's so typical of that particular, uh, of that particular robbery. I also agree with you about Olmstead Falls. I think they're going to make strides this year in their passing game. Um, you know, I don't think a coach goes in there wanting to be, you know, one dimensional, but when you're that effective on that one dimension, 
it's hard to sit there and really nitpick a team that's consistently in the Southwestern Conference title race. It's consistently in the situation where, um, you know, they're doing it and they're doing it the way that they always do, which is, uh, you know, running the ball. But now they're adding a little bit of the passing attack. I think North Ridgeville, I think Amherst, I really do think Amherst is, a, is probably a dark horse in the, in the, in the Southwestern Conference this year. There's not, they could be, they could go either way. To me, it's kind of, they're always kind of like a Shaker Heights team. Sometimes they have, they have a really strong year and then they just kind of fade other years. They're dominant. You know what I mean? So I think we could see that going in and, you know, North Ridgeville, it's there. They're still, you know, they're struggling, but again, they're not, it's, it's, it's that Southwestern conference. It's every team every week is, is a big game. It's a good team you're playing. And I think those are, you know, something you have to take into account. And, and like, and like you mentioned, Sean, uh, for like a team like North Ridgeville, who who came out and, and didn't have a very good game, lost thirty five nothing. That's fine. But uh, this year, unlike any other year, you have the ability uh, to get better, and and your your opponent doesn't necessarily. Uh, well, they have the same opportunity to get better, but things things change. It's not it's not like it was the past years. Game film is different. Um, you know, you don't have as much. Uh, scouting as you could yeah. do uh, for that. So it's, there's a lot of questions that are still up in the air. So now it's on to the individual teams to focus on what they didn't do good to improve on. Uh, and it's more so, Hey, this is what we need to do. The other team needs mm-hmm. to stop it. Be prepared for us. Absolutely. And it, and it goes along the lines too, a lot of in-game adjustments. And this yeah. is where you're going to have coaches with a lot of good in-game experience. Those are the ones that are going to thrive. Um, and that are able to make those in-game adjustments quicker, and that's going to lead to a lot of success and, and winnable games this year. It'll be interesting to see, I mean, a team like North Olmsted who didn't get a chance to play last week, and a lot of these teams that are starting their season in earnest this coming week, um, you're gonna, you, you wonder, does that put them behind the eight ball a little bit uh, against a team that's, you know, kind of – Kind of work. I mean, even in even in the best case scenario, you had you have the ability to know what live that feeling of live football, those live reps, those game reps versus practice or versus you know walkthroughs and things like that. Does that put those teams that like let's say is even a, an zero and one team they got blown out week one playing a team that didn't play last week because of the schedule? Does that put them at an advantage? It'd be interesting to kind of follow that. Uh, this week coming up, especially in the Southwestern Conference, which is a meat grinder under the, uh, you know, under normal circumstances. And now I just think that you may see a little bit of a, a separation of those teams that played. I think, you know, even if you lost this week, playing is the win. You know what I mean? Getting out yeah, there exactly. and, and, and playing and getting those game rooms. Yeah, that's a very good point because, you know, we already mentioned this. There's, there was no preseason. There was no scrimmages. Right. So a team like Olmstead or North Olmstead, who was – practicing you know they had their summer they had they were doing their thing but once you know they they had those uh, positive cases they had to shut everything down and I don't exactly know what their procedures were like you know during that but you know I'm assuming they weren't allowed to practice uh they weren't maybe they had zoom meetings like we're having right now um just to keep everyone on the same page but you know they're coming back after a break where other the other teams that they they're playing in their conference you know, had that, like you said, that in-game experience. So it's definitely going to put them behind the eight ball. And they're just going to have to, again, go week by week and, and get used to it. Essentially, this is their preseason before they get right. ready uh, for that that push. Certainly. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the, uh, the Southwestern Conference Coach of the Week that Rob shows uh, for, for the poll this past weekend. Olmstead Falls head coach Tom DeLuca. Uh, for their victory over uh, over Midview there. All right. Um, since we're still, I mean, we're about what thirty six minutes in. We go into break. We keep we we, we round this out. Just keep rolling. Just keep rolling. Excellent. I will. I will just. Uh, we'll just roll to the Great Lakes Conference now because the. Um, I only have one game and Josh covered most of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> My bad. <laughs> The, uh, the Great I'll, Lakes I'll, Conference was break. Uh, took a break this week, apparently. I'll, I'll provide a. I'll provide a little bit of color from the east, from the, the Illyria Catholic side. I. I. I sh- sorry, I should 
we had I had another game, but I just couldn't find much information on it. So here we go. Um, as Josh mentioned earlier, Illyria took on Illyria Catholic. Illyria Catholic was a Division Five playoff uh, qualifier in 2019. Uh, they had a lot of big hopes riding on the arm of Steven Navalinsky and wide receiver Jared France, in addition to uh, some studs on defense. Um, it was a close game to start. Uh, it was a 7-7 to score. Navalinsky was able to find Jared France on fourth down for a 14-yard touchdown pass to tie the game up. Uh, but that was about it for the Panthers offensively. They were not able to establish their pass game with the inclement weather. Uh, Illyria rattled off 20 unanswered points behind a strong rushing game and an opportunistic defense for the 27-7 victory. Navalinsky, uh, he did have 10 of 29 passing for 116 yards and a touchdown. Um, a lot of his passes just were not able to be handled due to the, due to, uh, the conditions. Jack Canale and uh, Alex Carandang both caught four passes for the Panthers. Illyria's defense was, uh, was fantastic this game. They smothered the running game. They forced four fumbles and recovered three of them, one of which went for a touchdown um, to, uh, to give Illyria that victory over Illyria Catholic in a crosstown matchup. Illyria Catholic falls is 0-1. Um, as far as I can tell now, they are open for week two. Illyria, uh, as Josh said, is uh, 1-0. They will await Strongsville. Um, provided they are able to compete due to their COVID situation. The Great Lakes Conference welcomed a new, mem a new member to the team, from, uh, to the conference from the Southwestern Conference. The Lakewood Rangers uh, joined the Great Lakes Conference. They hosted the Brush Arcs of the Western Reserve Conference. Uh, this was a pretty tight game. The Rangers were not able to overcome the Arcs. They fell 35-28. to 28. Uh, Pete Pes uh, Petsoris, uh, is known more for his ability on the basketball court. He scored three times for Lakewood. He had 263 yards on six receptions. Um, and he also, uh, he also doubled at quarterback and, uh, and, and played very effectively there. Uh, Lakewood drops to 0-1. They will travel to Holy Name to play in week two. Brush is 1-0. They will host Lutheran East. Um, my player of the week is going to be Pete Petsoris for Lakewood. Again, six receptions, 263 yards receiving and three touchdowns. Uh, that is a tremendous effort on his part and um, well-deserved. Uh, welcome, welcome to the new conference. Now you guys can get in some run. So Great Lakes Conference, the, the, the conference of opportunity here. Um, so uh, I'm very, help, very uh, happy to welcome Great Lakewood into the fold and be able to get them, uh, get them some run here for, uh, you know, for, for a tremendous effort. Um, separately, uh, for the, uh, separately, which this game hasn't been, wasn't covered, but um, I'm considering this the Great Lakes Conference Coach of the Week, um, mostly because this team is going to be joining the Great Lakes Conference next season. Uh, Coach Dan LaRocco from Westlake. Uh, Westlake is playing the independent schedule. They had a big 28 to nothing victory over Sheffield Brookside in their season opener. Uh, that's Coach LaRocco's first win as a head coach at Westlake. Uh, so congratulations. He, uh, you know, he was our, uh, he was a, he was a Great Lakes Conference's representative uh, for that, uh, for that honor. And uh, so for as far as next week's concerned, um, there are, are not a whole lot of, uh, from what I can tell, is a completely open slate. Uh, so if there's anyone who wants to give me information on Lakewood versus Holy Name, I will go complete all out on that one uh, because I don't have any other games to cover. Uh, um, you hear that, well, neighbors? Um, just a quick note on that. Uh, according to Joe Idol, the Lakewood Holy Name guy game got canceled, but Lakewood is now right. playing Padua. Oh, Jesus. All, All right. right, so, so Lakewood, Lakewood, so it doesn't matter. Lakewood's playing a Parma team. It's fine. Um, yes. So uh, Lakewood and Padua. I have some friends that are, I have some friends that are Bruins. They can give me some information. Here we go. Uh, Lakewood and uh, and Padua getting after it next week. And again, there's a, you know from what when I did this recap over the weekend, I didn't I didn't see a, a whole lot of other games from the Great Lakes Conference. 
a lot of those teams are going to be kicking off in week three, most of which are playing a GLC schedule uh, in advance of their uh, in advance of their playoff runs. So, so we cannot do the Buckeye recap this week. So just no, so we couldn't. Knows. We couldn't. Right. Rob's not. Rob's not here to forget to do it. Right. So or that or forget that we did it. That also was me. true. That was me. Also and true. That. He uh. Yeah, he really he really picked this week. He picked a good week to have off, didn't he? Um, right, to be on assignment. So <laughs> exactly. So that worked out well. Um, as far as the Great Lakes Conference is concerned, um, there is now ten teams in the conference. There will be uh, up to twelve because uh, North Olmstead is also going to join that conference here in the in the coming season. So there will be a twelve team. It'll be a twelve team two division conference. Um, when that happens, and that's another year down the line. Uh, but I would look for, uh, as far as who is going to stand out this year, uh, I'll just simply tell you that the defending co-champions are Parma Heights, Holy Name, and Medina Buckeye. Uh, Buckeye joined the conference last year from their run in the Patriot Athletic Conference, and they immediately showed that they belonged, uh, and they were and they were able to take the comp- be, be, be co-champions of that conference with schools that are now either comparable size or bigger than they are. Uh, it just goes to show that great coach Dennison has built a, has built on the tradition and the success that past coaches uh, have had at Buckeye. Uh, so we'll see where that goes. Holy name uh, is, 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 and Leary Catholic and Bay. Those are were all the, the playoff qualifiers from last year in the conference. You won't see a whole. Quite honestly, you won't see a whole lot of these teams in the plain, in like the in the local papers, top twenty-five. But nonetheless, they will have the they they came out with four playoff qualifiers out of nine teams last year across various divisions, and and, and it's a very very. It, I liken it to the Southwestern Conference in that you 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 get in a conference play pretty quickly, and you have to and and all the teams are pretty comparable. You're not going to be able to to sleep on many of these games, you know. So it's a great conference, and we're, we're certainly glad that we were able to bring them into the fold. And uh, we'll see we'll see where it progresses with everything going on this year. Moving on to my my cohort, my compadre, my colleague, my former South, South Suburban League uh, pal. Uh, he is now taking over both the American and the national divisions. Sean Duffy will take over the suburban league recaps uh, to, re- uh, and then go to the game of the week to wrap up the show. All right. All right. Thank you, Ed. It was a, not a full slate in the suburban league. Uh, I don't think we can say that for any of our leagues that we cover, but I did have four count them, four games to cover two in the national that featured national conference matchups and then two cross conference matchups that we'll get to. We'll start off first. Hudson traveled into Nordonia and Hudson was able to ride a dominant rushing performance on its way to a victory over Nordonia. Hudson rushed for 382 yards and six touchdowns on 69 total attempts for the entire game. They were led by running back Drew Leitner, who had 28 carries and 139 yards with three touchdowns. Quarterback Jacob Paltani, 17 carries, 101 yards, and one rushing touchdown to add to a passing touchdown he also had in the game. And running back Aiden Lau had 12 12 rushes for 75 yards and a touchdown. Nordonia was led by Billy Levack. Uh, the quarterback who had 172 yards and two touchdowns passing. Both of those touchdowns were to Joel Jones, uh, who had ended the night with 75 yards receiving and two touchdowns. Running back Sal Perrine chipped in with 26 carries and 130 yards and two touchdowns, but it was not enough as Hudson was able to get the win 50 to 27 over Nordonia. Hudson will travel to Brexville in week two. Nordonia will host Barberton in week two. The next national conference matchup saw Wadsworth traveling to North Royalton, and Wadsworth wasted absolutely no time uh, in putting North Royalton to bed quickly in a rainy day. Wadsworth quarterback Mitchell Evans, a Notre Dame recruit for the position of tight end, mind you, played quarterback in this particular one and put on a show. He went 15 of 24, 352 yards, 
three passing touchdowns, one rushing touchdown. Guys, all of that was done in only three quarters of work. He didn't play the fourth quarter. He had almost 400 yards passer. I don't know well, what you we want know from Sean's him. favorite player. And he's, and he's not even going to be a quarterback. He's not even going to be a quarterback at Notre Dame. He's going to be a tight end, which is perfect because that's probably when he'll get drafted in the NFL. Anthony Serena led the way on the ground with two – I'm sorry, with, I'm sorry. Anthony Serena led the way in the passing game with two receiving touchdowns. Barrett Labus had one receiving touchdown and a rushing touchdown. Brennan Gray – also had two rushing touchdowns. It was, I mean, it was a Wadsworth show from the beginning to the end. North Royalton got two rushing touchdowns from Zach, and I'm going to really mess this name up, Abameda, uh, and a TD reception from Tyler Montgomery, but it just wasn't enough. Again, final score, Wadsworth 54, North Royalton 21. Uh, Wadsworth travels to take on Stowe in week two, and North Royalton will travel to take on Highland in week two. Uh, as Highland will open up their season against North Royalton. My cross-division matchups this week saw the Brexville Broadview Heights battling Bees travel in to take on Aurora, and the Bees running back Garrett Cubitz led the way. 18 carries, 111 yards, and three touchdowns. Quarterback Joe Labas, and that's the quarterback for the battling Bees of Brexville. Uh, he went 9 for 21, 97 yards, one touchdown. An efficient night for him, but they were getting so much done on the ground. He didn't really have to put it up in the air too much. He did a great job in leading that offense. Obviously, he's a, he's a he's an Iowa commit. He'll be playing in Iowa. So he's definitely you know, on the lookout for t- in a situation where it wasn't raining cats and dogs and there was questions about throwing the ball around. Uh, Aurora's QB, Alex Moore, with 6 of 10, 160 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. Uh, one, uh, one touchdown reception was caught by uh, Alex Cardman, who also had an 88-yard kickoff return in the game. Uh, but, unfortunately, it just wasn't enough as Brexville was able to win 35-21 over the Aurora Greenmen. The Bees will host Hudson in Week 2, and Aurora, again, travels to take on Revere. This will be the first of four, count them, four straight road games for Aurora. Guys, take a picture. Aurora, take a picture of your team. You're not going to see them for four weeks. They are not going to be at home for four weeks straight. Our, my last and final game saw Stowe versus Barberton. This game was suspended at halftime when Stowe led 2 nothing thanks to a safety. Unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot on this game because it started middle of the day on Saturday. <laughs> it picked up at 1.30 in the afternoon on Saturday. Uh, but Stowe would end up adding two touchdowns. Barberton would add one uh, for a final score, 16-8. to eight. Stowe, uh, Stowe wins 16-8 to eight over Barberton. Again, Stowe will, go, will host Wadsworth in their home opener in week two. Barberton will travel to Nordonia in week two. My player of the week. Obviously, if you were listening in the beginning of my breakdown, it's Wadsworth quarterback Mitchell Evans. Uh, good luck at South Shocker. Bend, my friend. My friend. My, my coach of the week, Jeff Goff of Hudson, uh, after a really, really impressive week, uh, getting the team to focus and also getting them to really focus on the run game. It was a great strategy by him, obviously. Great execution by the players to lean on a great on a running team. Um, looking at the Suburban League early in week one, obviously you're taking out um, majority of the National Conference did play. Uh, only two teams from the American Conference played. That's going to pick up a little bit in week two. You know, one thing I'm impressed with is right now, if, you know, I'm looking at the, the, the house stacked the national conferences, when you take into account Wadsworth, you take into account uh, Hudson, you take into account Stowe, and you can even throw Nordonia in there. I mean, these are really good teams. All I think all of them are in the top 25, uh, according to cleveland.com. You can even throw in um, Brexville, too, uh, as well. I think you're, you're seeing that, um, you know, that the national conference right now, as, we, as it was last year, is, is very much a meat grinder. Um, so I would not. I would be very surprised if a national conference team didn't make a deep, or two of them made a deep run into the playoffs, depending upon uh, where they get seated and everything like that. You know, Aurora has a tough go of it, man. Four straight road games. That's that's you know that's that's definitely not something you want to look forward to, especially when you only get six to begin with, 
and you go in, and then you go right into the playoffs. So you're, you know, it's tough to do. Barberton, jury's still out on Barberton. I think a lot of that had to do with momentum being interrupted, having to stop and then pick up wherever you left off. You know, you're subject to basically starting a new game uh, all over the next day. But definitely some action in the Suburban League uh, in week one. The schedule for week two, we have, as I mentioned, Barberton traveling to Nordonia. Hudson will be battling the Brexfield Broadview Heights bees, and Wadsworth will be heading to will be heading to Stowe. Uh, Copley and Cuyahoga Falls will officially kick off their season. They're facing one another. Aurora will travel to a rear to Revere to open up their season uh, at Revere, and North Royalton will travel down I seventy one to Highland and take on Medina Highland. So that should be an interesting matchup there. Little crosstown rivalry. Uh, other than that, that's all the news is fit to print uh, for the suburban league. Guys, any thoughts? Well, it's oh, no surprise. Seeing, um, wow. Uh, thanks, Ed. It was no surprise with Wadsworth. Uh, they're really still continuing. You know, we saw them uh, last year making that great playoff run. They are a really well coached uh, team, they have a lot of talent. It's just a solid program. It's one of the key uh, top uh, programs in the Suburban League that uh, kind of the, the cream of the crop. Uh, so it's no surprise with them that they, they continued uh, on their winning ways. Um, really looking forward to seeing Highland uh, get back in the fold here. You know, last year was kind of a little bit of a down year for them, uh, but uh, they're looking to turn that around this year. Uh, and Brexville, uh, Brexville Broadview Heights, you know, they're, they're a team on the cusp um, of, of really – uh, being able to do some great things. Uh, and especially, you know, th this is a great season. It's almost like uh, Major League Baseball, um, you know, where they kind of expanded the playoffs a little bit, shortened season. Same thing kind of goes with this in, in football. I mean, you know, everyone now is making the playoffs uh, if, you, if you're if you opted in. So you do have an opportunity to really do some great things. And, and you know, nobody really wanted to see – to be like this nobody wanted to heck 2020 to be like this but you know to, to look at it from a positive point of view if you're a team like you know Brexville or um you know your other teams of Highland um other teams that haven't had a lot of playoff success if you're able to get in the you know you're in the playoffs and you're able to make a, a run those kind of things are what kind of propels a program to getting more kids involved getting excitement around the program and that leads to, to building the program. So I, I think for a lot of teams that maybe haven't had the playoff success in the past, this is an opportunity for them. Uh, to, it's more wide open for them to, to make a run and, and to really establish some good things. And, and the teams like, you know, looking at the, the GCC, you know, Medina, uh, they, you know, they've had a little bit of a playoff success uh, getting in there, um, you know, over the past few years, but not really been able to make a run. Uh, Brunswick maybe being able to get back in it this year, uh, making a good run. The same thing goes for teams in, in all of our conference that will be able to do that. So uh, that's what's kind of fun. Uh, and, and you're seeing uh, these teams it, every week. It's going to be something different. But for Wadsworth, going back to them, they've continued their winning ways and what they're usually, used to doing. I like what I see out of uh, Brussels Broadview Heights. They shared the champ. They shared the Suburban League National Title with Wadsworth last year. Uh, you you got to see what they could do when they had a, a healthy Joe Labus. Uh, he was uh, he was hurt as a sophomore, and that led to their 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 0 and 10 season. Garrett Kubitz was also a sophomore at the time and takeover quarterback. And uh, you know we saw what they were capable of doing last year, and and I'm certainly looking forward to seeing what they're going to do this year. I don't have anything else to add about what you said about Wadsworth. They're, they're, just, they're a tremendous program. Uh, Trey Schaefer from last year, Mitchell Evans this year, and then Joey Boffman, obviously, uh, coming out, coming away with Mr. Fo Mr. Ohio or Mr. Football in Ohio uh, back in 2017. Uh, just a tremendous program there. Um, Stowe has been on the up and up lately. Um, Hudson's always tough. And um, Nordonia, when they have the right guys, they're they're they've also proven to be very capable as well um you know so i i kind of harken back to my my days covering the national division and i, I still kind of quasi follow them uh, a little bit closer than some of the other conferences but um 
you know, that's it, overall, it's just a great league. And, and I'm looking forward to seeing how that's going to play out as well. All right, Sean, uh, yeah. let's go. Let's, let's go. Let's go to you. The game of the week, the Ashland arrows traveling up route, tra- traveling directly North on 71 to Bagley road to take on the Berea mid park Titans at George Finney stadium. Yeah, and after about an hour and a half drive uh, up to Berea, and then you know another half hour warm up, say hey, we we're delighted to another forty five minute weather delay because of thunderstorms that caused a uh, a bit of a delay. But nonetheless, they got the game off exactly at seven forty five. So kudos to the uh, Berea Mid Park staff for getting this game in. Um, but I will say this: the beginning of the game was a very sloppy game. Um, There was a lot of penalties, a lot of fumbles that were recovered by Ashland, and then nothing was done with them. Neither team in the first quarter could get anything going. Ashland had a a really nice uh, drive going early on, uh, but just could not get past the 23-yard line and attempted a field goal that was missed. And again, there wasn't, a, there was not a lot of traction for kickers. I heard that coming off the field, even on an artificial turf in which Bremen Park plays on, it just had gotten so so saturated with rain that you know it was tough for any kicker to get their uh, to get their footing. Really, um, I think even the one one of the kickers for Ashland, I remember him coming off saying, "I'm going to have to switch to instead of the rubber cleats that he usually has, like he actually screw in cleats that he had." And, he had, and I guess he did that because as we started the second quarter, hang on a second, I lost everyone. Sorry about that. As we start the second quarter, uh, you know, Berea Mid Park was able to get on the board thanks to a nine-yard touchdown run by quarterback Luke Devins. But as, a th- as this will be a theme for most of the night, the, the, uh, the, the Titans elected to go for two. And they failed the two-point conversion. So they took a 6 nothing lead with about seven, and a half, seven minutes and 50 seconds remaining in the, in the second quarter. Uh, Berea Midpark would then intercept a pass on the very next drive, and that would lead to a 15-yard touchdown pass from Devins to wide receiver Cameron, Cameron Kupak, who, if you, if you don't remember, uh, Coach Hunig mentioned by name on the, in the interview. Uh, and he had a pretty good night. Uh, in, in, in scoring that touchdown. Again, not a lot of trust in the kicking game. I don't know if it was the weather or if it was just maybe they didn't feel it was necessary. But again, another two-point conversion attempt, another two-point conversion failed. The Titans ended up leading 12 nothing with about five minutes left remaining in the, in the, court, in the half. Ashland finally got in their stuff in order and was able to score on the very next possession that was capped off by a four-yard touchdown run by running back Ethan Hartley. Uh, but they also missed an extra point, so it was so the game was actually 12 to six with about a minute 40 left. And Berea Mid Park was in the old I formation, which I don't know if they're actually used to that or where they actually had a running back sitting directly behind the. Uh, the quarterback. Uh, I don't know if they had a fullback, but I know they, they shuffled a couple guys into that way. But uh, Aquan Bell ended up uh, fumbling the ball, and the arrow recovery, uh, the arrows recovered the ball, led to, and that led to another touchdown as time ran out. This time, a two yard touchdown run by Declan Rohr. So at halftime, uh, and they were actually able to make the extra point. And this is why I mentioned I think the uh, kicker actually switched cleats. Because after he missed that extra point, I heard the coach yell, get your cleats, get your cleats. And I said, oh, I made a note of that. Uh, so that halftime, we had a 13-12 to 12, uh, score in favor of the visiting Ashland Arrows. Um, you know, the third quarter, very much like the first quarter. Uh, it wasn't It was in a very long halftime. Um, a lot of both teams – I mean, here's the thing. In the first quarter, it was sloppy play. It was penalty play. In the third quarter, it was where the defenses kind of put it on a little bit and kind of settled in. So it was more of a lot of uh, taking advantage of missed execution plays uh, for each defense, which led to again a scoreless quarter. Uh, so the so at, at the end heading at the end of the third quarter, the score still remained 13 to 12 in favor of the uh, visiting arrows. Ashton was a Ashton was able to stop 
the Titans on the fourth down in order when to open the final to, fi- to open the final quarter of the game. Uh, the Ashton was able to put together a scoring drive that utilized probably one of the toughest running displays I'd ever I had seen in a while. Uh, running back Ethan Hartley was – I don't know if it was just his running style, but it felt like people, the first two tacklers that got to him bounced off and he would just fall for six to seven yards. So even when it looked like, you know, Marine Mid Park wrapped up, they still had an opportunity. He, this, this guy still just kept pumping his legs, pumping his legs, and he would fall forward, fall forward. Um and what it did was put a lot of pressure, and the defense kind of crept up a little bit. And what happened was, um, on then on a few plays later, uh, Declan Roar was able to connect with Landon McFrederick for a 31-yard touchdown catch, touchdown pass and catch, uh, which was a direct result of a really, really excellent play action. Because at that point, they committed all things to stopping Ethan Hartley. So when that play action held. He was able to, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Declan Roar was able to throw the ball to Landon McFrederick for a touchdown. Uh, another missed extra point, so I guess the cleats didn't help him as much as he thought, uh, which made the score 19 to 12. This was early on in the fourth quarter. Uh, the Titans would answer on the next drive, thanks in large part to a great passing attack, which is very similar to what we're used to seeing from John Hunick's offense. Short passes, short completions. Uh, get up on the ball, really, you know, make the defense adjust, make the defense stay home, key on their receivers. But it was it was another – it was an absolutely – and what was really cool about this um, is, one, they converted a fourth down, which was their own – they converted a, four, a fourth down and long, actually, which was their only first fourth down conversion on the night. I want to make sure I'm clear on this. At no point did – Berea Mid Park kick a field goal, an extra point, or punt the ball. They either turned it over on downs or they, when they scored a touchdown, they tried for a two-point conversion, and they failed on every one of them. So what happens is after they convert the fourth down, Luke Devins throws a beautiful pass and that is caught by wide receiver Jack Arnold. And I, when I say it was caught, it was bobbled and brought in with one hand directly in front of me, and he dove for the pylon. It, I mean, I've seen that happen in professional football. I've seen it happen in college football. But that was one of the best catches I've seen since I've been covering games at the high school level. It was a fantastic catch. I wish I, wish I could. I caught it on film, but unfortunately I was holding an umbrella and text and trying to keep up on Twitter with one hand. So I wasn't able to take as many videos as I would wanted to, but so say la vie. But it was a it was a touchdown nonetheless, and unfortunately, like it's been that whole night, uh, Berea was unable to convert the two point conversion. Ashland held a 19 to 18 lead with about seven minutes remaining in the game. Now Ashland at this point went into chew the clock mode. They were not passing the ball at all. It was. It was uh, Ethan Hartley running the ball. It was uh, uh, the quarterback, Declan Roar, running, running the ball. And it looked to be working because what was happening was is they were getting first down, first down, first down, but they were waiting to the very end of the play clock. So, so it was just tick, 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 tick the whole time. Um, but unfortunately, or actually, fortunately for them, for the Titans, Ethan Hartley – or I'm sorry, Hartley did – fumble the football, and Berea would recover on their own 23-yard line. Unfortunately, the Titans would again find themselves a victim of their own self-inflicted wounds. A crucial, and I mean crucial, offensive pass interference called negated a huge gain that would have set the, them up in the red zone uh, and re- looking to score. Right after that, there was a sack that lost them even more additional yards, and then another failed fourth down uh, which kind of spelled, spelled the end for uh, the Bremen Park Titans. They actually would lose the game 19-18. to 18. Uh, Ashland uh, does improve to 1-0. Uh, they were led uh, by, I, my name, them, my co often, oh, co-players of the game, uh, Declan Rohr, who had a rushing and a passing touchdown, Ethan Hartley, who had a rushing touchdown. They will face, the Ashland Arrows will face Mount Vernon at home in week two. The Titans, unfortunately, they fall to 0-1. Uh, luckily, it's not anything in the Southwestern. They're 0-0 in the Southwestern Conference. They look. They don't. They no rest for the wicked here, as they have to rebound in Week Two 
and they have to go to Avon. I mean, sorry, they host Avon Lake uh, at uh, Baldwin Wallace Stadium. So, guys, that's the game of the week. I'm sorry I rambled through it. I was just getting shivers remembering how cold and rainy it was and trying to remember everything that happened in that game. But it was – I mean, look, it's not – the traditional atmosphere we're used to. There's, there was no, at least for mine, there was no band. Uh, there was no, you know, a lot of crowd noise, things like that. It was very quiet, which was interesting because I was able to hear a lot more uh, of the coaching. And you could really tell these coaches, as much as they seemed frustrated at times, really enjoyed being out there because they got to, they were playing football. And like we talked about earlier in the show, it's those live game reps that are hard to duplicate. Yeah, you can practice it. You can do whatever you want to do in practice, but it's hard to replicate uh, game game reps. So that's pretty much it for our uh, for our game of the week. Well, tremendous job as always, Sean. Um, thanks for braving the uh, braving the elements there, um, and uh, and getting us a good story there. It's a great game, if nothing else. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you know which is the games that we like to cover, but we want to cover the good games. We don't, we don't particularly like seeing the, the uh, 30 point running clocks uh, if we can help it. So thank you to, uh, you know, thank you to Berea mid part for hosting us. Um, and we'll see if we can get back out there at some point in time this year. But as Josh uh, alluded to, we will be going, you know, we'll be at uh, Brunswick Auto Mart stadium next week. At least Josh will be covering the Medina Bees, not to be confused with the Brexel Bravi Heights. Bees! Taking on <laughs> the Brunswick Blue Devils. Uh, both will be 0-1 going into that matchup. Uh, so uh, tremendous action uh, across all four of our conferences this week. Any last thoughts as we go into week two? Well, yeah, think, uh, uh, a couple thoughts. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when we uh, went to Berea Mid Park, that was actually their first loss when we were actually there uh, covering. So uh, that streak ended. Uh, but I think we started a new one with Westlake, uh, having uh, their head coach, uh, Rocco Odd. Uh, he was uh, he interviewed, and they got their first victory. So a little of uh, Berea Mid Park's SOT magic uh, went on to them a little bit. But I'm sure there'll be plenty more victories when we come uh, to Berea Mid Park. Also, second, yes, you're right, Ed. Thanks. The game of the week will be Brunswick uh, Medina. Follow us at SOT Podcast um, for all in-game updates, videos, and, and more. And then there'll be a story up on the website after that. Uh, with the exception of this uh, episode tonight, which will be on our YouTube page, uh, every Monday, for most part, we'll be on Facebook Live. So we'll be on here live. Um, this will be on our YouTube page as well as all the rest of our shows. So make sure you head there. Um, other than that, um, you know, we didn't have much practice either. We kind of went into it, but uh, being unbiased, I think we did a very good job covering as well as uh, the teams did a good job playing this week. Uh, looking forward to week two, fellas. Should be good, man. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, no, thanks for thanks for watching. Uh, again, follow us at Sports on Tap. Uh, check out, follow us on our website at SportsOnTapPodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter at SOT Podcast uh, for all the uh, you know for all the action going on in the Great Lakes Conference, Greater Cleveland Conference, Southwestern Conference, and Suburban League. Uh, check us out on Facebook and. Uh, and, and check us out and check out not only this podcast, but previous podcasts on our YouTube page as well. For Josh Jeffy, Sean Duffy, and Rob Chaplin, who was on assignment tonight, we did not need to do the, re the Buckeye recap, Rob. You're welcome. This is Ed Dick signing off Whoa. on Sports on Tap, and we will see you on the other side. Thank Good you. Good night, everyone, from the champ. We'll see everyone next week. Oh. Ugh.